The death of Jackson Salas has gone with no investigation for the past three years. His family have been outspoken that they believe this was a homicide. There are so many questions left unanswered. Why was no one in the apartment questioned after Jackson was found deceased? Why was his death automatically deemed an accidental overdose when the drug found in his system was infamously known as the date rape drug? You are such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my video. I'm Brooke McKenna and please, please today help me join in with this family and fighting for justice for Jackson's solace. One more time. Justice for Jackson's solace. Justice for Jackson's solace. It could have been your child. It could have been your friend. It could have been you. And unfortunately, it was us. And we want to know why, you know, our demand um, is to get a proper, thorough, complete, comprehensive investigation that includes answers to our questions as parents. It is speculated upon whether the case is closed or not, but we will get into all of that. It is a heartbreaking case. This family has started a petition to try to get something done, but I think by the end, you are going to be just as confused as the family is on why nothing more was done and why certain behaviors were occurring from the police as well as the medical examiner's office. So let's go ahead and get into it. So it was 2020 in California and Jackson Salas was a 20 year old man living in Oakland. At the time, he still lived with his parents who were Angie and Jim. He was very close to them. Angie and Jim are actually Filipino American and Jackson and his older brother, Alex, had actually been adopted from Korea in 1999 when they were both babies. Jackson was actually nine months old at that time. And Angie and Jim worked at the same place where Angie was in human resources and Jim was in supply chain operations and they worked really hard in order to send their boys to private school. They were a well-off family. They were very happy. The boys had a very good relationship with each other. They were close in age, but Jackson was actually so smart that he would help his older brother with his homework. Jackson was known to be this vibrant, mischievous joker who was hardworking. He loved life. He was always making everyone laugh, but mainly he was remembered for his big heart and his empathy. He would make Spotify playlists for his friends based on their own taste of music. And when he was a kid, he would stand up to the bullies. And as an adult, he continued to try to stand up for what he believed in. And he was very, very strongly against discrimination and mistreatment due to that. In fact, he once quit his job at a coffee shop because he believed that the supervisors were mistreating the manager who was a young black woman. And so he quit, but not only did he quit, he used his voice as well and he wrote this lengthy letter to the CEO explaining exactly what had happened and why he had left. He believed that this was casual racism and he was angry. You see, he was a proud gay Asian man and he had come out to his family in 2015 and Alex's older brother had actually come out as well so his family had taken the boys to the pride parade together in San Francisco and they were all so happy. The family, their parents especially, were very, very supportive. They loved watching their boys grow up and seeing who they were becoming but their youngest son's life would be cut short far too soon. You see, on March 1st of 2020, Jackson would head to an affluent area in San Francisco for a blind date. He had allegedly met this man on a dating app and he was headed to a high-rise apartment on the 300 block of Fremont Street and this was the Rincon Hill Apartments. Now, normally anytime that Jackson was out and about, he would tell his parents whether he was coming home that night, around what time he would come home, and though he was an adult and he didn't have to do this, he was just very close with his parents and he knew knew all about, you know, safety. And so he would always inform them. And so that night they called him around 11 PM, asked him if he was going to be home and he informed them that he would be. However, that wasn't the case. And his last post on Instagram would be a story, which was a picture of the Bay Bridge from inside of a high rise apartment at night. By March 2nd, his mother Angie would receive the news while she was at work and she was told her son was dead. 
Now she immediately collapsed and began screaming and then she bravely pulled herself together in order to inform her husband and they together then went home to see what was going on and what they could do. You see, after getting the 911 call, officers had arrived on the scene at this high-rise apartment and they had declared a adult male deceased inside this apartment. There was no hope of resuscitation and while the entire Solace family gathered together at the home, they were anxiously awaiting answers and answers that weren't coming. They were suddenly being told that officers had conducted an investigation where they didn't find any evidence of foul play at all. They were saying that the family should wait for the police and medical examiner reports for information on what happened. Meanwhile, the family held Jackson's funeral with only 10 people allowed in attendance because this was in the height of COVID. And according to the family, they didn't receive any of these official reports until months later. And they were continually asking, they were following up, and nobody was getting back to them for months. And when they finally did receive the documents, it was only three pages long. This is when they read that Jackson had actually been found deceased in the bed of this man's apartment and he was naked. And the owner or the resident of this apartment, who was believed to be Jackson's blind date, was actually a 41-year-old white male. Now, this man has not been named in any public records. They saw the family would then see the medical examiner's report, and this was done by San Francisco medical examiner Michael Shavosky, and the toxicology report found that Jackson had cocaine, methamphetamine, and GHB in his system. Now, this is actually gamma hydrobutrate, which is commonly known as the date rape drug. Due to this though, his death was ruled as a probable drug-related overdose and it was ruled as accidental. The final report of what happened to Jackson Solis was allegedly given to the family in November of 2020, eight months since his death. And in the medical examiner report, a statement from the 41-year-old man claimed that he and Jackson had gone to bed around 2 a.m. And when he woke up at 6.30 a.m., he heard Jackson snoring. And so he went on to shower, clean the apartment, get ready for work. And then around an hour later, he found Jackson deceased and called 911. This man also admitted that there were other people in the apartment the night before, though these reports often differ whether there was multiple people there or whether there was one person who would actually been the person to bring Jackson to that apartment that night and it was this mutual acquaintance between Jackson and this 41 year old man but none of those reports are disputed or confirmed. Now the assistant medical examiner was actually pressed on the lack of investigation at all by Jackson's mother Angie and she was allegedly given the response as to why there was no investigation with the comment the gay community uses GHB. Jackson's uncle and cousin went to the Emmy's office to pick up Jackson's belongings that were there and they were allegedly told by a member of the Emmy office that the community, the gay community, parties and it often results in overdoses. The uncle then claimed that he was also told by a, another worker that day that there was another overdose victim who had come from that very apartment a week prior but that victim had survived. We spent the first year trying to get reports. Jackson is Asian, he um, is gay, and so- Regardless of sexual orientation, he should have an equal investigation as anyone else. Now, while the medical examiner's office was claiming that GHB was something that gay men used recreationally and that it wasn't necessarily meaning that it was, you know, given to him as a date rape drug, Jackson's friends claimed that they had never seen him use GHB and his family began to believe that there hadn't been an investigation due to Jackson's sexuality and that if he was heterosexual, both the San Francisco Police Department as well as the San Francisco Medical Examiner's Office would have fully investigated the circumstances in their son's death. Now, the Emmy spokesperson neither confirmed nor denied the statements that were allegedly made to the family, but they did say that sexual orientation did not influence the medical determination. This is when the family began to petition for the police captain, Timothy Falvey, and the medical examiner, David Serrano Sewell, to investigate Jackson's death. 
They claim that they have tried to do an investigation themselves. They even saw that on Jackson's phone, which they can't gain access into because there's a passcode, they could see that there were 38 texts between Jackson and this one number prior to his death. They actually used the internet to identify who this number belonged to. They stated that this person didn't want to talk much, but told them to contact that 41-year-old male apartment owner, and then they didn't want to speak anymore. And so at this point, the family gave that information to the police who allegedly didn't do anything else with it. So in January, 2022, so we're almost two years from Jackson's death, the family finally received a copy of the body cam footage worn by an officer that morning when Jackson was found. And this was about 95 minutes long. And the footage hasn't been released to the public yet as far as I could find, but allegedly the owner of the apartment and the 911 caller had opened the door and officer Louis Wong was questioning him and he had said that a friend of a friend had brought Jackson over around 5 p.m. the night prior. He said they weren't the only two there. There were other people but around midnight to 2 a.m. it was just him and Jackson and everyone else had left. They fell asleep on the bed and he said when he found Jackson not breathing the next morning while he was getting ready for work, he immediately called 911 and they told him to move Jackson's body to the floor, which he did. Now, he was asked by the officer to write down the names of everyone else who was there and Officer Wong then called the sergeant and said that Things were kind of hinky, so he was probably going to notify homicide. And you can't hear what the sergeant says, but Wong then says, you want me to wait? And then he says that he will wait for the ME, the medical examiner. And Wong then allegedly went back into the apartment and told the man they were just trying to tie everything together, that they don't know what the family is going to do, and that they're going to be upset. He allegedly told this man, we're just trying to protect you. I'm just asking just to protect you. That's all there is to it. This 41 year old man then allegedly told the officer, I'm not offended, I'm effed. I don't know what the F happened. Now, when Jackson was lying deceased in the apartment, this officer apologized to this man that he had to go through all of this. He said, I know you probably have other things to do. We're just trying to make sure that, you know, so they don't try to come after you because it happened in your place. That's all we're trying to do. And he then assured this man that he would remain anonymous in any sort of lawsuit. Now the Emmys arrived an hour later and it took them 13 minutes to call this a drug related issue with no trauma. Now crystal meth was found in the closet of this apartment and was confiscated and the man admitted they did not belong to Jackson, that he didn't even see Jackson consume any drugs, but he had used his vape pen. And after the drugs were confiscated, no one was arrested. Now this is where the statements begin from the entire law enforcement office in San Francisco. Police chief, who was William Scott, confirmed on January 26th, 2022, that the investigation of Jackson Solace was closed, that there hadn't been any criminal filing from the investigation. But then on February 4th of 2022, California State Senator wrote a letter to the police chief as well as the chief medical examiner, and he was saying that the circumstances around Jackson's death remained unclear that the statements made by the medical examiner's office were highly offensive, inappropriate, and dismissive of a drug overdose, that the police department reportedly chose solely not to investigate this case based on the medical examiner's medical determination. They had never even interviewed anyone inside of that apartment. We need to make sure that the community has trust in our government, including in the police and the medical examiner. Parents shouldn't have to speculate about what happened when their child has died. He wrote, while no investigative outcome will ever make up for the loss of a child, Jackson Solace and his parents deserve a full investigation regardless of Jackson's sexual orientation and regardless of which communities do or don't use GHB. To be clear, I am not prejudging whether a criminal act occurred. I am, however, asking you to ensure that a complete investigation occurs. And then, suddenly, two days later, the San Francisco Police Public Information Officer would make a statement on February 6th. And that is when they said that the chief who had said the investigation was closed was mistaken, that he was talking about a different case and that the investigation into Jackson Solace's death remained open. 
By February 26th, the family teamed up with the Asian Pacific Alliance and held a vigil that was attended by more than 80 people. And that is when the Salas family allegedly first met the senator and they were getting to talk to him about everything that happened. And they allegedly also got to talk to the police chief, William Scott, who agreed to review any evidence and actually listen to their concerns at this time, which was the first time since the death. However, this didn't do much to move the investigation at all, and so Jim and Angie actually hired an attorney who requested an inquest without LGBTQ bias. The release claimed that the Emmy's office had conducted several faulty investigations around the same time, and now these were not specified. However, there are some strange things that have happened that I did find with the police department and the Emmy's office, so we'll get into that in a bit. But the attorney spoke about a case that was eerily similar, and that was the case of Ed Buck and how Jackson's death is basically a San Francisco Asian version of that case. You see, Ed Buck was a white gay businessman and political donor who called himself a gay rights activist. However, he also got away with drugging, sexually assaulting, and killing two young gay black men. And he got away with this for years. Rumors were flying that he actually had a history of bringing black men to his home, injecting them with crystal meth for sexual gratification. And once they were unconscious, he would sexually assault them. This was in 2017 when Jamel Moore was found dead in his apartment, naked on a mattress in the living room. Two years later, though, the same thing happened with Timothy Michael Dean, and both times, meth was found all over the apartment, and both times, no arrests were made. Both were at first deemed accidental drug overdoses. Finally, in 2019, due to 50 civil rights organizations calling out local law enforcement to conduct a thorough investigation, he was charged with three counts of battery causing serious injury, administering meth, and maintaining a drug house. And four years after the first death in his apartment, he was charged with Jamel and Timothy's deaths and was sentenced to 30 years in prison. A 30-year-old man was also believed to have survived Ed Buck just six days prior to his arrest. It was theorized that this 41-year-old man could be the next Ed Buck. Now, looking into the San Francisco Police Department, I found that they did create a bulletin that they posted on their website back in 2016 to strengthen the relationship between the police and the LGBTQ plus community. It was stated that SFPD would treat everyone with dignity and respect, and that in the state of California, the LGBTQ plus community was legally protected from discrimination, bigotry, and assault. But four years after that was posted, this family believed that their gay Asian son wasn't given any sort of justice or effort and wasn't treated with dignity and respect due to his ethnicity and sexuality. Now, two experts were asked to watch this body cam footage that has yet to be released to us, whether this officer Wong was acting as a professional when interviewing the apartment owner. Now, a law professor and a criminologist believed that his tone was normal for being a police officer who was trying to keep a suspect talking and trying to make them feel comfortable so they, they wouldn't just go silent and ask for a lawyer. Though they did believe that it was quite strange that they would confirm to the man that he would be anonymous, as though he knew for certain that this man was never going to face any sort of charges. The two experts though also did answer the question as to why nobody was arrested for drug possession in either the cases of Ed Buck or this case. So these two experts claim that that's quite normal actually because they don't want the threat of being arrested to deter people from calling in overdoses and getting the people the help that they need because they're worried about being arrested. So sometimes the officers do just leave that be if there has been an overdose victim so people will still call it in. Jim and Angie and Jackson's older brother Alex said that they don't want another family LGBTQ plus or not to go through the same pain. Their change.org petition for justice says, we've spent the last two years devastated, paralyzed, and grieving Jackson's death and repeatedly asking for answers to our unanswered questions. We want the truth to what happened to Jackson that night and to understand why he never came home. On their petition, they have asked specific questions about how the SFPD have handled the investigation, including why no one was questioned about the drug possession found inside the apartment. You know, the 41-year-old man allegedly said they didn't belong to Jackson, but he didn't confirm they belonged to him. 
or said that who they belong to. They also never found out who the person who brought Jackson to this apartment, if it was set up by a friend of a friend, who this person was, nor did they question them at all. They also wondered if Jackson had ingested this GHB and if it was consensual, if he had taken this right before bed, why would the overdose have taken five hours the next morning to kill him? They also want to know why this apartment owner felt the need to clean and shower before calling the police. Was he just getting ready or was there more to this? And of course, they also want to know more about this alleged prior overdose victim who had survived. And they want to know why the police never questioned this person either about what had occurred and if they really were in a near-death experience at that same man's place. According to BuzzFeed News, the police were asked about the prior overdose that happened at this apartment and they allegedly said that they were unable to speak to statements made by another department and so nothing was ever confirmed or denied about if this actually occurred. Now while digging into the San Francisco Police Department, I found that two years after Jackson's death, the SFPD at Central Station actually settled a discrimination lawsuit with one of their officers. You see, back in 2018, a man named Brendan Mannix said he was harassed and discriminated against at this police station due to his sexual orientation. That he was mocked, he was called dramatic, or that he was being a queen if he asked for anything. He said that the city failed to prevent harassment against members of the LGBT plus community. And he claimed that he often heard horrific comments not only being made about gay individuals, but transgender people as well as a Muslim officer. Then, while he was working as an officer, he started being ignored when he would call in for backup. He has since transferred out of the SFPD and the lawsuit was settled in 2021 with him receiving $222,000 as a settlement. Discrimination is still happening today. It's even happening within the police department, within their officers. And it was definitely happening at the time of Jackson's death. Now in 2022, Captain Christopher Del Gondio became the first gay captain at SFPD. However, many have questioned whether this is actually a change or a way to silence the claims against them. Now, Jackson's family have asked the public to not only sign the petition, but write a letter or copy a letter that they have already written and send it to the emails of those in power in San Francisco. I will have the letter as well as the emails on the screen and in the description if you would like to do so as well. But the last update was on March 4th of 2023 for a rally to honor Jackson at the Civic Center Plaza and demand justice. They are still fighting three years later. And Angie said people loved him. Don't think our family's just going to roll over. The unfortunate thing about this case is that due to a lack of investigation, most of this information is alleged due to no documentation. I mean, of course, we want to believe the family and, you know, what they have been told and what they've been given, but we don't even know if what they have been given is the truth. There is really so little to go on, which is why it's so important that we really work together to get this petition signed, have the most signatures, and get an investigation going because until then, there's not much that the family can do. It has nearly 150,000 signatures. They are just 3,000 away from their goal, and I would love if we could bring them to their goal. So please head over there, sign the petition, leave them some comments, and just share this case and share the story of Jackson Solace. And really, all they are asking is for an investigation. They do believe that this was murder, but at the same time, they are just wanting to make sure that their son's death wasn't ruled in the wrong manner due to his sexuality or his ethnicity. And that's all they want is the truth. And to know that their son was treated respectfully after his death. And I don't think that that is too much to ask. His race and sexual orientation are huge parts of why his life and his case were dismissed. The way Jackson and his family have been treated was unacceptable, and we are not willing to, to stand for that. Um, demonstrating that by signing, sharing the petition, sending that to people who are in power, have the decision to reopen this investigation, that is our clearest demand and next step. The more this case is shared, I'm hoping that someone from that night will come forward or someone who has even previously survived this man because someone knows something about what happened that night prior. They noticed something, you know, strange maybe about this man in general or they encountered it themselves. This is how we can move forward in this case and we need the support 
of law enforcement unfortunately we need them to do more investigating i think just like with ed buck's case it's so easy to just say oh well these people just were going crazy on the drugs and overdosed and that was it there was nothing you know wrong about it but when you bring in a drug that is known to be dangerous known to be something that predators use as a date rape drug I believe that an investigation should have occurred just from that. And no matter if his community uses that or not, that's not an excuse to not investigate whether this was used in a dangerous manner against him or not. I'm so thankful that I came across this case because there are very few sources on it. And really this petition by his family is doing all of the work to spread it out. His family is the only ones who are still fighting for their son and they shouldn't have to do it alone. So please, with me, help to spread this case and to hopefully demand justice or just demand that more is done. They deserve that. So don't forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough and I love you to absolute pieces.